Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Trader Brillo Show for your Friday edition. Uh, a short week for me, although I feel a lot better today. I feel good enough. I know. I said I wasn't going to do this. I feel good enough to have an ISO glass of whiskey with everybody. So cheers, everyone. I hope you uh, had a great trading week. That Today's session probably has a little people, a few of you with whiplash. I see Ron saying cardiac arrest Friday. I don't know about cardiac arrest, but it was certainly a volatile wild one. So let's dive into it. So with the image that I have here, whew, Bib and Tucker six-year bourbon, nailed it. Uh, with the image I have here today, I was trying to find something that kind of uh, piggybacked off of what we talked about on yesterday's show, which was really more about the retail sales side of things and how we're seeing the consumer in the driver's seat just saying, I'm not buying stuff right now. I'm going to slow down my spending, and that it could have some, some lasting effects on our financial markets. Now, the good news is next week we have – two incredibly important pieces of economic data coming out. I forget the dates. I'll, I'll make sure we, we're uh, aware of those next week. But I think it's, I think you actually have like a Thursday and on a Friday, you've got preliminary GDP numbers, which are expecting a significant contraction on uh, to the tune of about 1.3%. And the previous month was 1.4% contraction. So these pieces uh, obviously going to not bode well for the markets. If they come out worse than expectations. And then the second piece was the PCE core price index, which they're expected to stay at 0.3%, which would be in line with expectations. Remember, the Fed right now, I think, has its eyes focused on one thing that's inflation. So if PCE starts to spike, uh, tail end of next week could be even more wilder than uh, this week. The Goliath roller coaster would be appropriate. You know, I did a roller coaster ride graphic a couple weeks ago. I, don't know, I think it was actually last week I had a little roller coaster ride, so maybe I'll just have to make up some new ones. But yeah, it was definitely a roller coaster ride. Let's take a look at some of those numbers, especially the way that we ended today. Um, we had some pretty ugly looking negative numbers, especially for things like the Russell 2000. All of a sudden, you know, your last hour or so of buying just ripped that thing up. Here is, I'll do it on a five minute. And you can see that we bottomed out right around 10.30 Pacific time and then just smoked to the upside. For the Russell, it was actually a pretty nice run to where we are right now. You had an increase in the Russell 2000 in 41 five-minute bars, uh, about 2.5% increase. Now, that said, even though you had a great rally for the Russell, it still didn't finish strong for the week. Here's an hourly kind of showing you the whole week. Um, let's see. We start things off here on that 16th. So uh, down for the week. I didn't get a chance today, unfortunately, everybody, to look at the, the actual weekly numbers. But you know, one thing I like to do, real simply, just make it a weekly chart and just look at this week's candle. So if I run through here, you can see we've got a pretty decent-sized red candle for the Russell, but it did not make the lows from last week. The Dow broke lows from last week and a huge red candle. I mean, this was an ugly week for the Dow. I'll give you the percentage here in just two seconds. Bear with me. Uh, from Friday's close of last week to where we are right now, you're talking about roughly 2.7% down for the Dow, which um, is, is a bad week. I mean, Dow usually is one of the more stable ones, but not so much this week. Same thing for the NASDAQ. You had the NASDAQ breaking the lows of last week and also um, just a giant red candle down to the tune of about 4.4% for the week. And let's see, keep moving out the list here. Gold. Finally, we had a little bit of a move up in gold. Thank goodness for the week. Uh, I'm also, as you guys know, an SLV, which is my silver position. Glad to see that pop. This is a bullish Harami pattern. So I know some of you focusing on uh, different price patterns. Well, there you go. Uh, this is actually a pretty positive sign. Um, I did sell. As you guys know, I had 3,200 shares of SLV that I had sold covered calls at 2350 against. Collected some very nice premium on that. Um, however, I've obviously lost a lot on the actual value of SLV because of this big sell-off over the past three weeks or four weeks. Now that said, um, I did I sold the puts or sorry, I sold calls at 23.50 to add uh, income streams to the position I already own, and I took that profit and sold puts against that position to maybe get some more. And you'll notice today that I am down at 1986. Right now, um, sorry, not 1986, that's the low there, 2007. So I sold the 21 puts. I'm going to have more SLV in my portfolio. I will have 3,500 since I sold three puts at 21. Uh, I will now have 3,500 shares of SLV in that portfolio, and we'll have to see what happens next week with regards to me selling some puts or calls against that current position. But uh, good to see commodities, gold and silver, 
have a nice stellar week. S&P 500 kind of followed suit with the Dow and the NASDAQ. As you can see, it did breach the lows as well. But on the week, this number wasn't as dramatic. It was down about just, just barely 3% on the week for the SPY. Uh, looking at crude oil, which is one of the more volatile ones for the week, kind of a strange looking week, right? We've had these long bottoming tails. And I'm going to ask you guys, what do you, what do you think that this tells you? If you look at this chart right here, let me get rid of some of these lines. Just looking at this, this is a weekly chart. Remember, every candle there tells you the story of a battle, right? It's the it's a, a battle between buyers and sellers for the course of whatever, it's five, six, seven days trading, depending on what this is tracking. In this case, it's five and a half days worth of trading. But it's telling me something. When I look at that picture, it, it's it's very clearly saying something in my mind. I'm just curious whether you guys can hear it talk to you. And I, the longer you do this, the more you start to feel the charts are talking to you. But you notice the long, the preponderance of bottoming tails, right? So you have, most of these have these long bottoming tails below it and small tails up top. That, in my opinion, is a bullish sign. It basically says that it's tried, they've tried to push it down, but the buyers keep pushing it back up. So this in theory, at least from my perspective, you can definitely differ, that's okay, but this is just how I'm looking at it. Uh, it looks to me like crude oil is getting stronger here because it's been its ability to shrug off big red candles and close near the highs, which I think is a very positive sign. Now that's on a weekly. You look at the daily, the picture's uh, choppy, right? I would say that certainly the past month or so for crude oil has been really not, not the best looking chart. It's been fairly choppy from March through June. However, it is starting to make higher lows, starting to make some higher highs. We did uh, hit this high back here right around 115 then sold off. Uh, we'll see if we end up challenging that one. But it does feel, when we look at that weekly, like it's shrugging off those, um, those selling attempts and pushing higher. So that's, from the big picture, actually a very positive sign for anybody who's bullish on crude oil, which I think Big Ev might be bullish on crude oil. Uh, Michael says more buyers for the sellers. Yeah, I guess the, the imbalance, right? The imbalance means you have more, I guess, buying pressure at the end of the battle. And I, I always make this joke that if you're having an argument with, with your significant other, it's, you know, what, what's the most important word to have in the fight? And most of the guys are saying, sorry, honey, that's a good one. Um, it's usually the last word, right? And the last word on those weekly candles that we saw here on crude oil had been had by the buyers, because they pushed it up off those lows. So the sellers were winning at some point during the, those trading weeks, but the buyers came in and closed it near the highs. So in my mind, fairly positive. Now, let's go look at the something that's not as positive. It wasn't uh, making new lows this week, but still not quite out from the firestorm and fallout of Luna and UST. You've got Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies overall. We're just getting a, a drubbing this entire week. And certainly today was a pretty bad day for cryptocurrencies overall. Um, the one saving grace I have with Bitcoin is it's still kind of hovering right at these levels. It hasn't really aggressively fallen down, which kind of is my, my foresight there, is that we're going to see Bitcoin continue to drift down just because the overwhelming negativity and regulators are now putting more of a spotlight on cryptocurrency and digital assets because of the Luna debacle. So um, that year is your major stuff there for the week, at least uh, on a weekly basis. I didn't rank them from high to low like I normally do, but thought I would share that with you. Uh, SPX right out of 3,900 uh, when there's a large number of options, both open interest and... Mm, I don't know, Tom. You know, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't follow that. I used to years ago look at open interest, and then I just um, I found that it didn't help me in my trading back then. So I just one criteria I don't look at. Uh, what happened with Luna is it's it's kind of hard to explain, Michael. So in the in the grand scheme of things, what we're experiencing is an evolution of an entire ecosystem of financial assets, right? From uh, decentralized exchanges to lending protocols to insurance protocols to uh, stable coins and monetary systems it's all brand new and i think that there's still a lot of learning curve that goes on with it and the excitement is about having a decentralized currency like luna or Dai, where no one centralized figure can quote unquote control the price so that's called an algorithmic stable coin, which is just a model that is not quite tested. All right? they, there's, there's several algorithmic stable coins, um, but it seems like they all have problems. And unfortunately, somebody exploited a, a major flaw in UST and Luna because they understood the architecture. They looked at the math behind it all and said, wait a minute, here's how we can crash this thing 
and somebody did it. So what happened is you had you know forty billion dollars worth of digital wealth evaporate in a period of about 72 hours. And that, of course, sent ripple effects through all of cryptocurrencies. But what it really did, in my opinion, three things. Number one, it shed the light on the need to maybe move away from an algorithmic stablecoin and, and define what stablecoins are and go to ones that are actually fiat backed. Number two, it showed which protocols can weather the storm the best. In this case, Bitcoin actually did really well considering there was forced liquidations of Bitcoin across the board. Uh, and number three, I think it sheds light on the dangers of leverage. So a lot of what we saw happen last week and a half was because of over leveraged people using way, way too much margin and getting liquidated, forced liquidation, which just further adds to market downside. So that in a nutshell is kind of what happened. Basically, Luna was a, we'll say a failed experiment. It was an architected uh, stable coin that had some serious fundamental flaws. And there you go. We could, we could do multiple shows on that one, but it, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let that one die. Luna was a, definitely a, an ugly thing for the crypto space, but in the long haul, I think it's actually really good. Um, Dixie correcting. You mean a little bit, what, some weakness in the dollar or just a little bit? Um, remember, when we looked at the Dixie, there's two things I want to look at here with this one. Is No problem, Mike. I have, thanks for the question. Is it correcting? Well, it's certainly slowing, right? I don't know if I would necessarily call this correcting, but correcting to me would be it's got to start making some new lows. Right now, it's just a pullback off the top. Not that big of a deal. The writing is on the wall, in my opinion, for more upside move in the dollar index just because of what the Fed is doing. Now, we also have to look at, if you're looking at the dollar, you got to take a look at that 10-year. So the 10-year is correcting. And you notice the 10-year right now is actually forming... You know, we can make the argument that it's a head and shoulders pattern. And yes, I know it looks more like a Quasimodo kind of head and shoulders. But, you know, if you draw something right along those lines, it's not a perfect head and shoulders. And of course, you know, there's that old phrase I love that says, if you torture a chart long enough, it'll tell you whatever you want to hear. Um, you know, you can kind of see you had this left shoulder, you have this tall head, and then the right shoulder just formed and broke. Well, you know, for me, this line right here, which is, let's call it uh, 2.728, that, that's a pretty important level because if it breaks that, then you're going to start to see you know, that weak trend and maybe a break of that uptrend. However, you continue to look at what the Fed is doing, the unwinding of the balance sheets, they're starting to sell off their positions. Uh, again, when you flood the market with that much volume of bonds, they're going to have to raise the yield. So even though it does look like it's starting to slip down here a little bit, I think you'll see that dollar rise or sorry, the, uh, the bond yields rise. And in turn, when the bond yields rise, that's going to take the dollar up with it because that means that more people are going to have to buy dollars to buy those bonds. And so your international buyers, China, Japan, European Union, UK, you know, they'll all be looking at, okay, I have to buy some dollars so I can buy these bonds and get better yield because we're not paying those kind of yields, right? You can go Go over to the UK. I don't have the UK bond market or the uh, Euro bond market here, but you know, are they going to be paying more than 2.7 percent? No. So they take their money, they buy US dollars, and then they buy our bonds, and they make an arbitrage spread and make money with their money by buying dollars. Um, that's a good question. Good question, Frank. What do we all have to be thankful for today? Um, boy, that's a tough one. Uh, I guess thankful for um, medical medical stuff to help you overcome ailments would be one for me for this week. Uh, you know, there was, uh, yeah, having good people around you, that'd be a good one for me. So, uh, NJ, you talk about Celsius looks bad. I agree. Celsius, I think, is not in a very good position. I think uh, actually I had a comment from somebody asking, you know, what about buying some Celsius? And I personally would shy away from that. Uh, where did I put Celsius? There it is. You know, Celsius, uh, their business model drastically changed because of what happened with BlockFi. Remember, BlockFi was offering yield to their customers and they didn't, uh, I don't know, they, they didn't do what they needed to do to appease the SEC and they paid a huge fine for it and all of a sudden BlockFi gets shut down. Then you got to look at things like um, Nexo and Celsius. They get shut down and stop offering yield. So, yeah, their Celsius token to me is, is uh, in search of a floor. And I think it's probably going to keep on drifting and drifting and drifting. Oh, thank you, Margaret. Appreciate that. That's nice. Thankful for the show. Well, me too. I'm glad I get to do the show every day. 
Checking out a new jam band with the family, not fish. No worries. What's the name of the band, Frank? And where at? If, uh, yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind going to see some live music. That'd be great. Awesome, Thomasina. Yeah, we should all go spend more time with our family. Um, okay, so there was a bunch of questions that came in here. I did not have a chance to prep everything, so apologize. I was actually doing an XLT session here. Um, so KF asked a whole bunch of different questions, so I'll see if I can get some of these out here today. KF says, um, which cryptocurrencies would you do you think are a great opportunity for a huge move in price in the future to put money into? There's no specific timeline that I have in mind, even if it takes more than 10 years. And also uh, the ones that you mentioned that don't have too good of fundamentals, but could be a pump and dump uh, that could have huge problems. Well, I, I, I shy away from the pump and dump stuff. I don't want to have that in my portfolio. But if you're looking at cryptocurrencies, again, you have to understand the, the full spectrum of what's out there, right? It's not just, hey, this is a currency. It's, is again, is this one an exchange? Is it an insurance protocol? What do they do? Um, and what is their role in this world of crypto? So there are a couple ones out there. Actually, uh, I'm really surprised that they're down as much as they are, and I think that they might be good for the long haul. Things like, um, no, not Solana. Solana is actually one I'm thinking of getting out of my portfolio. But things like Matic, right? Polygon. Polygon just been butchered recently. Uh, I'm in it from an average, I think, of about $1.35. It's now at $0.63. Cents, you know, And you look at its high back here. Polygon was designed to be a layer two scaling solution for Ethereum to make it faster. Well, they've done that. You can use Polygon to Matic on Ethereum, but they've also taken bunch of VC money and built out in it their whole ecosystem. So essentially, I think what might happen in the future is Matic could just change over and be their own blockchain, a standalone and not a layer two. So Matic, I think, would be a good one. One that I, I really like, which I believe is critical for the entire ecosystem, is uh, Link, Chainlink which is an oracle, which is where you get data from. So how do you get data into smart contracts? It's generally using external order external oracles. So uh, this one down at, I mean, it's under seven bucks and it was over $52 back in May. I mean, this is a huge discount. Granted, there was a lot of pumping going on back in uh, 2021 on this, but you know, at a certain point, you got to look at Chainlink and say, they're the leader. They're the ones that most platforms are using to get data into smart contracts. So it's a, a, an integral part of the entire ecosystem. I think Chainlink would probably be a pretty good one as well. Let me just start from the top and see if, which ones of these I like the most and, and dislike. Um, I actually like Cardano. I know a lot of people hate on Cardano. I think Cardano has done a pretty good job of slowly building out their platform. And it looks it looks appallingly bad right now, right? It's gone from over $3 down to $0.50. Cents. Well, they're, they've never crashed. They've never failed. They haven't. Solana fails like once or twice a week. Their system gets shut down. Well, Cardano is one of the more decentralized smart contract platforms, and I think that it's the slow and steady wins the race is what you hear so many times. So I think, um, you know, over the long haul, if, if Cardano can maintain its ability to slowly onboard developers, to be stable, to continually increase the protocol and make it better uh, and grow their ecosystem, then I think Cardano actually has a pretty good shot of competing in the whole Ethereum smart contract platform. And it's a, a relatively cheap one right now. I like Charles Hodgkinson as well. Um, let's see, Algorand's good. Cosmos is one that I'm definitely big on. So Cosmos is similar to what you see with um, Polkadot, where they're trying to unify and bring together multiple platforms, right? You've got a lot of different technologies out there, but they don't speak to each other. And if we take a step back and look at what happened to the internet back in the early 90s, you had different protocols. You had different ways uh, that these networks were functioning. And if one network was written in one language, another in a different language, they wouldn't talk to each other. So they came up with a standardized protocol that says, hey, let's use this protocol. And we can all communicate together. And now we have uh, a great, I guess, ecosystem for the dot com, right? We could all talk and communicate based off a standard language. And I think when you look at Polkadot and, and um, Cosmos, uh, that's what they're attempting to do. However, in that battle between Polkadot and Cosmos, I'm seeing more development in Cosmos because it's an easier to use interface from what I've been reading in, in here. Um, plus, there's a couple really cool projects on Cosmos that I like. So I would say uh, Adam would be a good one, which is Cosmos. Avalanche as well, although Avalanche has been struggling recently. Um, I would pick um, 
Adam over Avalanche. What else do I got here? No, none of these are good. Dash, no. I, I like Polka Dot as well, but, uh, you know, Frank says Dot staking for the win. Well, you know, Dot pays you 12%, but so does Adam, right? So you can still get your 12% here on either one of these. The, one, the problem I have is I don't see Polka Dot growing its ecosystem. I don't see it aggressively out there pushing and saying, hey, use us, use us, use us, right? What you need right now for any firm is aggressive marketing, right? Absolutely aggressive marketing. You, you got to have it. And it seems to me like I'm seeing more projects come out on Atom or Cosmos than I am on Polkadot, unfortunately. Um, let's see. I actually do like Engine, but, you know, the whole gaming area has been kind of hit gaming and NFTs. Uh, and that's where Engine was focusing their attention on. So I like Engine over the long haul. What else do I have here? Uh, I guess Helium Network, yeah, Yoda, Kusama, Chainlink. Uh, that's pretty much it for the big names I, that I really think are... Um, I'm actually... VeChain is another interesting one. You know, I look at, I look at what might be a you know uh, a great use case for cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And VeChain is designing or, or positioning themselves as logistics, right? So supply chain and tracking inventory and products and making sure that the Prada handbag you have is actually real because you can see it on a blockchain and all that stuff. Uh, VeChain. While they're out of China, and I don't necessarily trust all the information, it looks like they're really growing their system. They've got Walmart, Amazon, and uh, DHL are some of the big brands that are using their network to track products and services. So I think that's also another really good one. It's trading at $0.03, cents and it was up over you know 25 so not bad. And then that's on my list. That's probably it. Of course, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, Bitcoin would be my number one. Granted, I don't think you're going to get 1,000x out of Bitcoin, but it will be around in the long haul. Uh, so there you go. That was uh, KF. That was for you. Hope you, you got the information you wanted on that one. Let me see what I got comments here. Uh, Ada is still one of my largest bags. Yeah, Shinobi, it's it's not one of the biggest for me, but it's definitely my, I, would, it's, I think it's like eight or nine on my list. Uh, but I'm not getting rid of it. I actually, I, there was a point where I was like, I'm not buying anymore. Absolutely not. And now I'm actually thinking I might want to buy some more. I'm looking, if you look at Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, Polkadot, you know, not even necessarily Polkadot, uh, Algorand, and you look at that, those smart ones, uh, layer one smart contract platforms, which is the one that's been the most stable? Now, there's, it's the worst worlds of haters that hate on Cardano, but they are the most stable. They haven't crashed. They now have an algorithmic stable coin, which makes me a little bit, a uh, little bit nervous about that, but, uh, you know, I own all of those, just so you guys know, I own Solana, I own Avalanche, I own Algorand, so I, I'm making sure I have a little piece of each one, but I will probably build a bigger position in Cardano because of what they're doing. Could you do a show with step-by-step -step staking on Atom, pretty please? <laughs> That's for the CIL. That's my crypto class, Frank. That's the crypto class. Uh, Vera City and Gala Games also. I like Gala, Gala Games. <laughs> So Chase R, do you know anything about Curve? So Curve Protocol, I do know a little bit about it. I actually bought the Curve token because I wanted to use their protocol. It's awful. It, it's so funny. Let me show you this here real quick. It looks like somebody did on their Commodore 64. Uh, curve. Let's see if I can bring up their site because I was just like, this is hideous. Yeah, there it is. So it's actually connecting my MetaMask. Let me close that one out. This is Curve's protocol. And basically what you're looking at are liquidity pools and, you know, earning yield, yield farming, et cetera, through Curve. But the protocol, I mean, just I just feel like this is childish at best. I couldn't find anything that was really giving me any great rate of return. Um, but it's one of those sites where you can deposit your assets and earn yield. Uh, it's one of the more established ones that's been out there, but I don't use it at all. Rob, if you're doing homework on Cardano and, and um, ha Charles Hoskinson, I highly encourage you to watch the interview on Lex Fre with Lex Friedman with Charles Hoskinson. It was awesome. It really um, made me respect Charles Hoskinson quite a bit. Yeah, right, Shinobi? I mean, that curve interface, like, come on, man. UI, you got to have your user interface needs to look great. I mean, it needs to be catchy and awesome. This is trash. <laughs> Absolute trash. Chase says, my issue with crypto is there's been so much over-promising and under-delivering as a whole, but as long as the tech is doing something. Correct. Um, I agree with you. I think that what you're getting, and this is where it's up to us to be careful, it, you, you look at these projects and say, we're going to do this, 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 and this. 
great. Well, that's like you as an eight-year-old saying, I'm going to win the Super Bowl, I'm going to be an MVP quarterback, uh, and I'm also going to be a paraglide champion. Okay, sounds good to me, but you know, you got time to do that. And I think that's what's happening with all of crypto is they're all saying, hey, we want to do these things, which is why the bulk of my portfolio, I'm looking to buy into things that are that are actually working. They're actually doing something and creating something. So that's why you know Ethereum has been there because Ethereum is the backbone that everybody's building on. Hey, Chris, happy Friday, my friend. Good to see you. Charles also does a lot of Ask Me Anythings, which are really informative. Yeah, he, he does them every day. I mean, I've, I almost thought about asking him to come on here, but I know he's got way bigger things to do than sit and talk to me about trading and investing in cryptocurrency. But, um, you know, you look at, obviously, you you have the Elon Gate right now, right, which is this this accusation that he exposed himself to some stewardess uh, on, an, on an airplane or on a SpaceX flight or some some crazy thing. It's all going to come out of the woodworks now because he's such a central public figure. Um, if you look at Charles Hoskinson, you know you have another person, very similar to Elon Musk, which is trying to take technology and make the world a better place. And that's one of the main reasons why I bought into uh, Cardano is Hoskinson isn't uh, a greedy guy driving Bentleys and Ferraris and Lambo. He owns a ranch in, in Montana where he raises buffaloes and grows mushrooms, right? Uh, I think that this guy, his mindset is in the right place. It's saying, okay, I have the opportunity to wield a, a lot of power here by using this technology to make the world a better place. So that's one of the main reasons I'm a, a big Cardano supporter. But that interview with Lex Friedman will really make you guys go, wow, this dude's incredible. Depends on what kind of mining you want. Yeah, so Shinobi's probably um, way more versed at mining. So here's here's the gist of mining that you got to understand right away, Larry, and, and Shinobi will probably validate this one. Number one is you got to figure out what type of equipment you have. Are you using a CPU, a GPU, or an ASIC miner like Shinobi just mentioned, right? What type of unit? And so an ASIC is an application-specific integrated circuit. That's what that stands for. And basically, it's something that's designed to mine usually one or two types of cryptocurrencies. So it's targeted. Now, if you're looking to be a miner, it sounds great. Like you just turn on these devices and just money starts flowing in. It's not like that. First thing you gotta do is find out which type of equipment you're going to be using because that will help you focus on which cryptocurrencies you're going to mine. There are also tons of sites out there that will show you what you could be earning by joining a specific liquidity pool for these different cryptocurrencies. Then once you have that, you have to find out uh, what your electricity is. And then there's a lot of calculators that you can say, hey, I'm going to run this ASIC miner. I'm mining this cryptocurrency, and here's what I pay for, for energy in your local area. You've got to know how much your energy costs. When I did the numbers for me to mine Bitcoin or to mine Ethereum using an ASIC miner, it would have taken me three years to recuperate my cost. On Bitcoin, actually, it would never recoup. On Ethereum, I actually could get a break-even point at three years down the road. That's after buying this mining equipment and setting up all the infrastructure and paying all the utilities. But let's be honest, by three years down the road, that equipment's probably going to be obsolete anyway. So uh, what killed me here was the energy side of things. It was 16 cents a kilowatt hour here in Irvine, California, or Costa Mesa, California. Way too much. Um, it just didn't make sense. But some of you might have solar panels. Uh, I interviewed a guy last year, well, Tom Barr suggests him, awesome kid, that was doing um, solar mining rigs. Well, hallelujah. Now you have excess power, especially if you live somewhere sunny. Now that might change the whole math equation. So it's it's not as simple as I'm going to make money off mining. You have to find out your equipment, your energy, um, and then where you're going to be a part of. Doing it on your own, I wouldn't recommend it. You're probably going to want to join a liquidity provider, uh, uh, sorry, a liquidity pool, which is a, a collective group of people. And with that, there's membership fees. You have to pay to be a part of that pool. They get a little piece of a commission off of every transact, um, off of every reward, but you, you'll have more consistent income that way. So those are some of the big pieces. Um, again, I found it just didn't make sense for me in my area. But uh, if you're up in like Seattle, I heard that they have something like seven cents per kilowatt hour electricity up in Seattle, Washington. Oh, awesome. I mean, mine's 16% here, 16 cents here, and it's seven up there. You can imagine that the cost is going to be substantially different, especially um, one of my colleagues, their nephew was a miner of Bitcoin and he had the ASIC miners, but they generate so much heat. I would still have to run electricity to cool down my house. But up in Seattle, where this guy was from or outside Seattle, they basically use that as the heating element for their house. So now it's a win-win. They just put a fan behind it, blew the heat through the house. I thought that was really, really, really cool. Uh, been looking at GPUs today, actually. It's uh, crazy for just... 
420. North side, it's going to 420. I'll get to Tesla here in just a second. Um, <laughs> Rich, Google, Amazon are hitting the south. Yeah, absolutely heading south. Everything's heading south right now. You said it wrong. Elongate. Eli, yeah, right. That's the joke that's going. It's funny because last year, Elon said, if there's ever a scandal, call it Elongate. And I thought that was pretty funny. Um, how's every power is um, awesome, Shinobi. But Shinobi, you're in the UK, right? I, I'm, I thought in the UK, your electricity is pretty expensive as well. Um, hmm. uh, yeah, and there's there's so many things you can mine. You know, we, 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 we focus on things like uh, Bitcoin, but there's a lot, there's a whole spectrum. I had a friend a couple years back that was talking about Ravencoin and saying that his profit margins on Ravencoin is the, is far better than anything else. I'm like, okay, great. But remember, it's always going to change. You're, you, I think part of being a miner is you're constantly chasing what's the best crypto to mine. And it will fluctuate depending on uh, every moment in time. So there you go. That was a long-winded answer for you on that one, Larry. But uh, Shinobi here is probably your best source for that. Maybe Shinobi, you could do a show on uh, crypto mining. All right, let's see. Let's go and look at, since we, I want to make sure we get to some stuff here with regards to markets. Tesla, getting murdered. Uh, it's funny because we put a line on this chart. I don't know why it's not here today, but you guys might remember. We talked about uh, it closing this gap that goes all the way back to November 13th, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, was right as they announced their split. It's either the split or the inclusion of the S&P 500. I remember, forgot which one, but... Um, it gapped up and just kept on running. I think this was actually the split, and then this was the S&P 500 edition being November of 2021. Um, that $420 price target, it's not looking so bad right now. It's really interesting how uh, we're sitting right now at 663 on Tesla, but boy, uh, it could easily come crashing back down to that 400 mark. And you know, I have to, I'll have to revisit it, but I think if it does get down to that 400 mark, I, I, I might actually be a buyer. I'll probably start, if it does look that way, I may actually be selling some puts if I can get a good enough premium uh, and sell those puts right around that 400 mark. Why not? Tesla's on its way to 500. Yeah, I think so. You know, you've got to look at this this whole area here between May 21st or May 2021 and where we are currently, which is right at a demand zone. There's a couple small little demand zones, but nothing really that strong. Uh, until you get down to let's say 540, right? 540 is really that line in the sand that hasn't been tested since 2020. Um, after that, I think even it'll go lower than 500. I think if I think if it breaks 540, you're going to see it close this gap. There's really not much to stop it there. Let's see what else do I got? Mm -mm -mm. Better off becoming a stake pool operator on Cardano if you like that type of working. Sell your selling your pool. You know what, Joe? That's another interesting... And again, there's so many different ways you can capitalize on this crypto thing. And I actually thought about be, uh, starting my own staking pool for a couple different cryptocurrencies. Um, however, there's there's risk and reward to that, right? You are required to keep your system up and running pretty much 24-7, depending on which crypto you're mining, or, or sorry, validating if it's a proof of stake. But uh, I found that it's easy for me just to stake on those protocols and not take any of that uh, extra effort in order to become your own liquidity pool or staking pool, just join somebody else's and pay, you know, 1% off the top and go that way. But yeah, you could certainly make a little bit more by starting your own staking pool. And honestly, pick a cryptocurrency, right? There's so many different ones you could start a, a staking pool on, but most of them are going to acquire a good amount of capital. You got to put up a lot of money to start those things and have a, a lot of that specific crypto to start in that liquidity pool. Let's see, Michael says, 20% uh, decline defines bear market, then Dow and S&B are both, um, yep. Less than 20%. We are not in a bear market yet. Well, let's take a peek at that just so we can go off the all-time high. So let's just go from that all-time high you see back there in 2020. So I'm going to go use my snap mode so I get exactly to that peak there that we saw on January 4th to the lows of today. Let's do it to the very low of today, right? Just, just for fun. That's a 20.81% decline. Now, what's interesting is you notice that today, technically, we were down 20% right? We were down 20% on the S&P, but what happened? It bounced at the end. And now we're down 18.88. So this happened back in 2020, just or not 2020, excuse me. This happened back in 2008. Multiple times we dropped below the, the quote unquote 20% mark and then bounced back up by the end of the day. Normally it was because of a Fed action. So let me uh, walk you through a little history lesson here because you guys know I like history. 
to some extent I like history. I'm going all the way back to the financial crisis of 2008. So there you go. So just so we can have the same kind of reference here, I am going to pull a line from that peak that we saw, which was on October 11th of 2007, and I'm going to go down exactly 20%. And that is right, right there. Okay, so let me put another line, which is, it says 1269, but honestly, the, the all-time high was 1556 on the S&P 500. So it's, um, oh, they, could, they have it 15, 1586, what they call it. Um, if you do the math, as I've shown you before, if you go to their, their all-time high, which is, if you can see right here on the top of my screen, it says 1586. 1586 times 0 0.8, that's 12.68, which is exactly where this, this upper red line is, right? Notice that we were down below that. So this day right here, which would be the 22nd of January, 2008, we were down below it. it would have been, an, oh no, we're in a bear market situation. And what happened by the end of the day? It ripped back up. Can anybody tell me why this market ripped up on January 22nd of 2008, we were down below 20%. It would have been officially a bear market. Can anybody tell me what happened that day that caused this market to rip up and no longer be in a bear market situation? This is what I think is orchestrated. And what it was, if there were two events that happened. Number one was they, uh, I believe it was January 22nd, we can go back and look. If this is where I want TJ or somebody to do, help me with my analysis. But um, if you look here, that day, January 22nd, is when Ben Bernanke and the Fed cut the Fed funds rate by 75 basis points. So the Fed juiced it this day to prevent it from staying below 20%. Then all of a sudden, we come down here. The next drop, which was March 17th of 2008, we officially dropped below not 20%, which means now we are in a bear market, right? But the market doesn't want that because if if the media starts saying we're in a bear market, then the retail investor goes, oh shit, they freak out, they start selling, and then we have that panic pandemonium chaos. So what happened this day is they bailed out Bear Stearns. They bailed out Bear Stearns. So you had two events that were, you had a rate cut and a bailout of Bear Stearns to prevent us from going below 1260 on the S&P 500. Fast forward, you go all the way back into July of 2008, they didn't have any more bullets and it fell below it, rallied back up, but that was the beginning of the end, right? That was the beginning of the end and I think that we're in a similar situation now. Today was interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. I've just got so many topics going on, but if you look what happened today, we officially did drop below intraday a 20% correction. Now it's happened a couple times, right? Um, in, in other markets, so you can, the NASDAQ's a different story. But remember, S&P is the dog that wags the tail. But if we go down 20%, which would bring us to right, let me get this snap off here. 20% on the dot would mean the S&P futures need to get to roughly, come on, uh, 3,849. I'll write that one down. 3,849. That's what the S&P futures would have to be at to be officially a bear market. Watch too big to feel, yeah, 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 I don't wanna, this stuff, I, honestly, Joe, I hate watching that type of stuff because it just pisses me off about the whole financial system. It's just, again, I believe it's a giant house of cards, but uh, it is what it is. Just keep our eyes on this level, and I'll put a red line, let's do it from this one here, this one's old, and we're gonna go 38.49, right? That's our 20% off the top. I'll leave that there. I'll label it so we can have that one to look at going forward. And I'm willing to bet you that over the next week or so, you'll probably see this happen again, where it goes down below it and then rips back up. And they're going to do what they can to prevent it from going down below that 20% mark because now all of a sudden you can start spreading fear and saying, this is the end, my only friend, the end. Now, to me, it's really going to line up with what happens next week, right? Next week's going to be very interesting again with... Um, the core PCE price index, as well as GDP numbers, you know, that to me is going to be the real breaking point for this market going forward. <laughs> yep. Uh, you know what? Um, I, I think, Big Ed, what you're going to see is my guess. 
and, and this is just my guess, is you'll probably see it tiptoe below this 3849 a couple times and then bounce back up, just like we saw in 2008. And then what you have is one or two big down days below it where everyone just goes, oh crap, here we go. And then it's going to have a huge rip up. It's going to be a bear trap. It's going to pull all these people in short and then it's going to scream up and have a huge up move to get all those people back out of their short positions and going long. And then we'll start to see the beginning of the, a much bigger downtrend. But um, yeah, I, I, I do have a list somewhere of our forecast for the end of the year 2022 and i'm i'm going to look forward to bringing those ones up in november and december because so far i nailed it i said we're going to be down 20 percent at some point and then we'll probably close the year down 15 percent and uh i might have been not aggressive enough tom says today we dipped below where you were where we were on inauguration day last year i think we are heading to pre-covid high soon um you mean so continue dropping, right? So you, you, when you say that, you mean we're headed to these these pre-COVID highs? So basically about dropping back down to 3,400? Is that what you're saying, Tom? I, I would tend to agree with you. Um, I, I think that that's where we're headed. I, certainly that's going to be one of your big stops is this psychological 3,400 mark. Uh, after that, I think you're looking at psychologically 32 and then, you know, then it's 22. But I, I that's a long, long, long way away. Yeah, cool. Got it. Uh, Northside, yeah, Macy's earnings coming out soon. Yeah, they're next week. I think Macy's is on Wednesday, if not mistaken. Consider this market when every other's in the same sector had terrible earnings. I'm considering shorting right before earnings. Uh, that's a that's a gamble there, Northside. You know my thoughts on trading earnings announcements. It's an absolute gamble because you just don't know. Remember, look how much Macy's has already sold off in the past couple of weeks, right? Let's just go from its peak on April 20th to where it is today. It's already down 30%. 30%. I mean, I agree with you. I think that all, re not all, the vast majority of retailers are going to have a sympathy sell-off with Walmart and Target because of what happened there. But we have Costco next week. You've got uh, Nordstrom's reporting next week. I think you've got uh, TJ Maxx reporting next week. Macy's, for whatever reason, was the darling. I mean, that, this chart of Macy's here from the 2020 lows is just absolutely insane. I don't get it. I don't get how it possibly goes from four dollars to forty dollars in a year and a half that is just unbelievable that's, that's a dot-com move for macy's um i think you'll you'll see this thing continue to drift down but i be careful going to that earnings that's a dangerous thing there north side just curious when even though dow corrected 35 percent for covid we were not in a bear market so maybe the rule is not hard and fast anymore uh, just curious even then even though dow corrected was yeah well you know i think in my opinion here, Michael, it's even though the Dow is down much bit more. So let's go. Let's go to the Dow. Bring up the Dow chart here, and we'll show you off the all-time high. So here's your Dow, and if you go to the low, not 35 percent, it's down 17 um, off of its peak. So 16.82 percent for the Dow off of its all-time high. Um, let me get the snap there. Yeah, it should be snapping. For some reason, my charts aren't. There we go. I got a snap, so I'll get there. What I'll do, uh, I won't do it now because I don't want to take up your time, but I will put 20% marks on all the four major market indexes that we follow. Right now, 16.96 is what the Dow is down, but really the S&P is the market. I, I look at the Dow as simply a subset of the S&P. The NASDAQ is a subset of the S&P. Pretty much every component in the NASDAQ is in the S&P 500. Same thing with the Russ. Uh, the Russell is a little bit different because those are small cap, right? That's independent. It's a different index. But the NASDAQ and the Dow are all in the S&P 500. So to me, that's the market. Um... Well, a report yesterday that said that uh, many re retailers have good inventories. So they might have to lower prices to move that inventory. What do you think? <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree. You know, when you look at, I believe it was, it's one of the big handbag makers. And I forgot which one. I, I got too much info in my head right now and I got brain fog. But they were talking about how like their handbags are normally like $1,000. And now they're selling them for $5,000 a handbag. Um, maybe it's Louis Vuitton. I think it might be Louis Vuitton. And, and their thought is, People are paying it, so we'll just keep raising prices. Uh, John O'Donnell, who I do want to get back on here. I keep meaning to bring him on. But John O'Donnell says something which is very, very true. He says, the only cure for a high price is a high price. At a certain point, you and me and everybody else are going to look at that and go, you know what? 
I'm not going in there anymore. Uh, you know, a good example is there's a ramen place by my house. It's one of my favorite ramen places. It is, it, it's so good. The noodles are the, the, what absolutely make it. And I used to go in there and I would get a, a large bowl of ramen, some pan fried gyoza, a glass of water, and out the door tax tip and everything. It was 21 bucks. I just went and did that one last week. Same thing. It was $33. So what have I told myself? I'm not eating there anymore. So a cure for a high price is a high price. At a certain point, that restaurant's going to realize we moved our prices up too much. And I think that's what's going to happen to a lot of retailers. So to Les's point, you stock up all this inventory and maybe you overordered because of all the supply chain disruption. You're like, I got to order everything. And now you're stuck with a bunch of it. I kind of made this point uh, near the end of the year, right? For our Christmas shows or holiday shows where I said, look, they're not going to get their inventory. So a lot of places are over ordering stuff, just trying to get whatever they can at a certain point, And I thought it might be February or March. A lot of these retailers are going to have extra inventory. And yeah, you might get some really good deals coming up here, especially if you and I stop buying stuff. So I would encourage all of you, don't buy anything right now. Save. We might go into a huge market correction here. Do you need another pair of tennis shoes? No, probably not. Do you need another, you know, uh, another another bicycle? Unless it's an electric bike, of course. Uh, you know, but let's hold off. Uh, wage inflation never goes down, though. Yeah. Well, you know, you are seeing. Um, um, there's two numbers that come out. Um, income. The income numbers have been rising pretty consistently, but I think at a certain point that's going to start to slow down as well. Uh, looks like we're tiptoeing into a recession right now. I agree, Big Eb. I think that you, I think that by the end of this year. We will officially have all of the, the pieces in place to say we are in a recession. We have slowing economic growth. The GDP numbers are expected to contract for a second consecutive quarter. Um, you have how uh, um, unemployment numbers are starting to tick up. It's nothing alarming, but they stopped dropping. They're starting to tick up a little bit. We are seeing retail sales numbers decline. We're seeing inflation continue to rise. It's like the storm is is definitely brewing, and I don't think it's really hit everybody yet. So. Um, you know, now is one of those times that as a household unit, you should really be watching your expenses and say, you know what, let me stockpile for right now. I'll hold off on stop um, buying stuff. <laughs> stop buying gas, please. Or ride an electric bike. Um, it's funny, the weather has been kind of terrible here, but I, I've ridden my bike to the office a few times and where do you think I'm charging it? I'm charging it at the office. You know, let's, let's the office pay for my electricity fuel. Uh, let's see. Hopefully it's not more war because of, yeah, let's, let's hope not, OG. Nobody wants more war. Um... You know, I think, yeah, we have some weird issues going on here in the United States, but of course we could point the finger and I'm sure Shinobi could tell us that the UK has got all kinds of a shit show going on as well. There's all kinds of bad stuff going on around the world. Just try to make the most of it and, uh, you know, save your money. I think save it up right now for a little while until you get more clarity on what's really happening. You know, one of the best things, the best position you can put yourself into is if this market does implode, and I know many of you think that there's no chance that's going to happen, that's okay. But what if it does? If this market drops 50% from here, most of the people you know are going to have no money in their accounts to buy it. And if this market drops 50%, I'm buying it. I'm, I'll, I'll be buying in a good amount. I'll buy some because I'm going to expect it to drop even further. But the key is to have some capital to buy back into long-term trends at much lower prices time those markets. And unfortunately, what you saw happen in 2009 is most people were broke. They didn't have any money. So who really made the big bucks? Those who were borrowing and institutions who were buying at those bottoms. Two quarters of GDP drop is officially a recession. Not officially anymore. That is what, that's what the media and economists will tell you. Um, I forget who it is. It's the National Bureau of something something is who actually declares if we are in a recession. And it's, it's not two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. It's not. That's one element, right? That certainly is like a, a, a big warning sign. But they look at a lot of other economic data as well. They will be looking at inflation numbers. They look at retail sales numbers. They look at employment numbers. And then they put the stamp on it. But as a guideline, yes, two consecutive quarters uh, is what most people consider to be a recession. But it's not official. Just, just making clarity there. Uh, let's see. Two consecutive quarters GDP drop is official recession. Now it's five weeks away, end of uh, second quarter. When news says recession, then it really kicks in. Yeah, because you spread that fear. And that's happening next week, right? It's either Thursday or Friday. I believe it's Thursday or Friday. I haven't looked at the economic count. You know what? Just because y'all are right here, let's go and look at next week. Here's next Friday. Here's Thursday. 
Yeah, so here's their GDP number. You can see the previous number was negative 1.4%, and they're expecting it to decline again, negative 1.3. So if this does come in line, you've got two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. However, remember, this is preliminary, right? So that's just the expectation, but usually that's the most accurate one. Uh, we'll have to wait until you get final GDP to officially say it, but it's, trust me, as soon as these numbers come out, the media is going to be all over it. We now have two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. And then the other number is happening on Friday, which is core PCE price index, which they're expecting to stay the same. Um, and again, that's the one that the Fed has said that's their metric for inflation. This could be a real big one. If we get a number that's lower than 0.3, then that might alleviate some of the pressure on the Fed to uh, raise. Right, so maybe we start to see those numbers drop. Right now, there's a 97% chance we're going to get a raise, a 50 basis point increase at the June meeting. This may change that, so keep your eye on this one on Friday. But we'll talk about that when we get there a little bit later on. All right, I think that's going to do it for me for today. I don't have much information on what's happening next week, uh, other than the latter part. There are some pretty big names coming out with earnings. I think you have AutoZone and. Oh, I can't remember. AutoZone and someone else is reporting on Monday, but it's not really that big of a name. The big name is actually happening on Wednesday, but we'll talk about that later on in the week. Bishop, you on caviar is next for you? No, I can't stand caviar. I think caviar is disgusting. I do not get it. Do not get it. Oh, boo. You're making me gag over here thinking about it. It's just salty eggs that pop in your mouth. I don't quite get it, but hey, to each their own, but maybe more sushi for me. Um, let's see. Actually, I'm considering, considering investing in Apple, Microsoft, Google for long-term investments, looking to buy at good prices, maybe 200 period moving hours on the weekly chart. Okay. So the only thing I would suggest to you on that one, and, and I, I love that perspective. Hey, Ron. Um, only thing I would suggest there is be careful, right? Because you look at something like Apple and you're thinking, holy cow, this is a good buy point, right? Look how much it's fallen. And we'll just real quickly play devil's advocate and say how much from peak to trough, it's down 27% off of its highs. Wow, great. Well, yeah, but you also got to take a peek at the longer term trend and say, where does it come from? Um, you know, if you go back into your 2015, I don't think we're getting down to those lows, but you could certainly see a much bigger decline. So North, uh, North side, if you are that type of trader who says, hey, I'm okay holding this for the long haul. I'm good with that then you just have to be comfortable with whatever number you pick, right? Because if you picked, let's say, I don't know, let's say you decided that uh, 124 bucks was your point for Apple where you say, this is it, I'm, I'm happy to own this one at this level, then you're good with it, right? But it could drop to 100, could drop to 90. I mean, you, it could go, I'm, I'm, I'm with Christian, Apple at 60, I, I told myself I can never trade Apple again. Uh, so even if it got to 60, I can't, but... Uh, I, that would be a, obviously a, a great time thought for long haul. The big Eb says 100, 100 buckish. Yeah, sure. But you know, if you are thinking that you want to buy it, don't let the fact that it's down 27% fool you. Remember, here's where it really speaks volumes. Apple's up 244% from those COVID lows. It's not like they reinvented the wheel. This is government stimulus. This is giving everybody checks and they're out there buying Apple watches and, and iPads. That stimulus is gone. There is no more stimulus. There is no more Fed backstopping the markets right now. They may step up at some point, but the, the, the pieces that cause this gigantic green or red line to the upside are no longer there. So be careful uh, thinking, hey, this could be a great buy point. It might be. But I think you could still see a lot of more downside potential movement because the catalyst to the upside is no longer there. Those pieces are not pushing the market up anymore. So uh, just be careful. This is a piece that a lot of people overlook is where we were just in 2020. And this wasn't like the world was recreated. It's just you had trillions of dollars pushed into the economy and that's not there anymore. So this is probably unsustainable. Ooh, yeah, Lucid. Woohoo! Oh, loving these ones. Uh, let's go to a daily here. Ooh, actually has a pretty nice pop. Dang it. I was actually, I told myself I wouldn't mind buying some Lucid um, if it got near 10 bucks. Well, it got fairly close. You were down around 13.50. It's up to 18 bucks today. It still looks ugly as heck to me. Um, but the good news for anybody buying Lucid right now is it's, it's still below it's IPO price. So no matter what price you buy it at right now, you're below it's IPO. Oh, sorry. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm thinking the wrong one. Uh, it's IPO is technically a SPAC. So it's not Lucid. It's Rivian. That's the other one. 
Its IPO price was 78 bucks on Rivian. It's currently trading at 29. Uh, you know, I think at some point these are going to be pretty decent buys and uh, maybe a buy point right now. To me on Rivian, you got to get above that $34 mark. But uh, the other one we talked about, guys, is Hood. I think you're going to see an announcement within the next few months, probably by the end of the year, that Robinhood has been acquired. And I mentioned this a while back. I do think you're going to see Robinhood get acquired by the end of the year specifically for its database and its access to the financial markets. And there are a lot of crypto exchanges, which I think would be a, a, a nice acquisition to buy Robinhood and, and get their database. And now these crypto exchanges could be Coinbase, could be Kraken, could be FTX, can now say, yeah, you can trade all these different financial products through our platform. We're universal. And they already passed regulatory scrutiny. Um, so Hood could be a good acquisition. I think that's going to happen by the end of the year. Blue chips getting um, repriced. Everything's getting repriced, my friend. It is the great repricing. The great repricing, as we saw with Colin Tedders of the Investor Channel the other day. Um, yeah, I agree with him. I think this is the great repricing of the financial markets. Bring it on. Let's do it. All right, everybody. That's gonna, I, I realized I was just kind of drifting on. Um, KF, I know you joined us late. I did answer some of your questions about crypto uh, early on in the program, so I will get to your other stuff maybe on Monday's show. Um, I did get some feedback that you guys probably would like to see the presentation that I did up in Vegas, so maybe next week I can do that one as well. Um, barring any any uh, unforeseen events, I should have plenty of time to do that. So thank you guys so much for joining me today. If you have comments, questions, feedback, you can put your questions down below the YouTube video. Again, I put those as priority to steer the co topic for the show. Or you can just email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com if you got any questions, feedback, comments, things you want to discuss, let me know. That said, cheers. Hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Go do something fun, even though it's miserable here in, in SoCal. It should be a nice remainder of the weekend. So I hope you all do something fun, and I'll see you all next week. Take care.